Hi, this video, I want to do a cleanup of a few miscellaneous topics uh, related to the PSHA calculations um, that didn't fit neatly into our previous categories, but I think are important to hit just for general reference. Uh, so first one is just other ways in which this PSHA calculation is written. Um, and this is a good excuse for us to rewrite it the way we're doing it. So our formula, we've been computing that the rate I am greater than I am is the sum over the, get this right, relative to our basis i equals 1 to n rep, the probability of i am greater than i am, given rep i in sight, times the rate of rep i. So this is what's in the book. This is actually following pretty closely from a proposal by Ned Field many years ago. This is a nice general formulation, but you're going to see other formulations around on occasion, and I, they're largely equivalent, just they communicate things in a little bit different ways. So I want to draw your attention to a few of them and point out what's different. So the earliest formulations look something like this top equation here, and I should note the left-hand side is always the same in all these. This equation was written out by Alan Cornell in 1968, the seminal paper that proposed this whole way of thinking and laid out the idea of seismic hazard analysis. It was also reproduced in a um, popular textbook by Steve Kramer in 1996 at Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering, other places. You'll see this. So what they wrote out, Alan and Steve and others said, let's do a summation over our sources, right? There's multiple sources, so we'll have to sum those up and we'll have a term for the rate of earthquakes on source J. Then we've got this integral here where we're going to have a PDF for the magnitudes and the distances on the earthquakes from that source. And then we'll make a prediction of I am greater than I am given those magnitudes and distances. Okay. One thing that was pretty important is that they had independent M and R. In the original paper, uh, Alan Cornell paper, um, the distances were distances to epicenters of earthquakes. And so that was reasonable. So it worked for distances to epicenters. But that's not uh, how we do things these days. These days we use closest distances to ruptures, and that's not independent of magnitude, as we know. It also, magnitude and distance were the only variables that predicted ground motion intensity measures. So again, in the 1960s, that was the state of the art. These days we have lots of additional predictor variables, so that doesn't fit very well in this framework. So if we move to more modern, I should also say the original Cornell paper, he, he did all of the hazard calculations analytically by like hand integrals. And so these magnitudes and distance distributions were continuous distributions that were integrated out. And he found some very clever closed form solutions to those. And moving to more modern times, we switched from integrals to summations and said, look, we're going to discretize over magnitudes and distances the way that we have in, the, in this class with the tabulated magnitudes and things like that. So that's the modern way we do it is always with numerical calculations. It's too restrictive to have to do it analytically. We also moved to joint distributions for magnitudes and distances, rather than those independent magnitudes and distances above, to reflect that magnitudes and distances are not independent. So we fixed a couple problems there. However, magnitude and distance, again, is not the only predictor variables for our ground motion models. So that's uh, still a little awkward. The solution that was put forward for some period of time was to say, let's add an additional <laughs> variable theta, and let's make it a vector. So this is a vector of other predictor variables. So that could be rupture mechanism, depth to the top of rupture, depth of sedimentary basins, soil condition values, all sorts of other stuff. And then the kind of clumsy fit here is to say, now we just need a joint distribution of magnitude and distance and these other variables, and we'll do an integral. So that kind of gets the idea across that we need all these things in our equation. But it puts a lot of emphasis on M and R and, and has this like awkward theta thing that's stuck on as an appendage for historical reasons. And so I think the more modern treatment is to say, rather than have this like list of specific predictor variables, why don't we just call this like the rupture site? And it'll, that'll emphasize that it's really like rupture variables and site variables that are the predictors. And in terms of the ruptures, rather than trying to have this joint distribution of kind of magnitude and other values and then have this other rate of earthquakes on a particular source that we have to track. Why don't we just roll all of that stuff up into the rate of ruptures and we'll just list out all the possible ruptures that could happen and how likely they are. And that'll tidy everything up into one place, right? So this kind of top formula is a little bit newer in the last few years, but I think it takes a step back from these kind of historical progression 
and not trying to shoehorn kind of our modern treatment of these calculations into these kind of older equations that go back many decades now. So that's one thing. Punchline is, if you see these other equations and you still see them in, in seismic hazard study reports and things like that, um, they're not doing anything different than, than what you've learned from me. They just have a little bit different equation of spelling things out. And hopefully eventually people will move towards a formula more like ours, but there's lots of people who haven't converted over there just yet. Okay, so that's one thing. Another thing is just to uh, raise awareness of tools. We can start looking at some grunt motion hazard curve data. And there's a number of places you can get that data from. One place that's nice is this OpenSHA hazard curve application. So that's a kind of a tool that runs on your own computer. You can compute hazard curves either using kind of input source models and ground motion models that they've put together for kind of standard cases, or you can customize your own, do your own hazard calculations in there. And it's got a very robust set of features and things. That's actually the software that the U.S. Geological Survey uses to produce their own hazard maps now but you can use it to do your own custom runs. So this is a calculation calculation tool. The second set of links here, these are more like kind of summary output results. So if you were looking in the United States and you need some hazard data, you can go to these two websites. There's a transition happening that in 2024, new tool rolling out with the release of their latest ground motion hazard curve data. But you can go in and, and put in a location, put in a ground motion intensity metric that you're interested in, put in your soil conditions and it'll give you out the ground motion hazard data as well as some additional metrics that we'll talk about shortly. That's it's mostly for the most part pre-computed and you're getting summaries. They will run some cases live depending on um, the, the metrics you're looking for and uh, give you out the results you need. And so that's results consistent with the U.S. Geological Survey's hazard study. And so that's really helpful if you're doing kind of building design and things in the U.S. and you're using that as a baseline point. So you can go into either one of these links and get ground motion data. Just to show you what that looks like, here's a couple screenshots off of the newer tool. So I input in a location and if you put in location and some soil conditions and things, that's not too critical for today's discussion. And you get from this plot here, you've got along the x-axis ground motion. So this is intensity measure. And each line here is a different intensity measure. So you can see peak ground acceleration and then spectral acceleration at a whole range of periods from down to 0.01 seconds up to seven and a half seconds and maybe longer, it got cut off. So those different intensity measures, the amplitudes are plotted on the x-axis and then the annual frequency of exceedance, which is the same thing as the annual rate of exceedance as we've talked about in class, that's on the vertical axis. So we've got a kind of visual result. So there's a kind of one line for each different metric here. And then there's also tabulated results. So we've got graphic results up top and there's lots of tabulated data as well. And I just grabbed a little bit here for the peak ground acceleration case. So it's just got the X and X, Y axis values from the plot kind of output uh, as text as well, that you can go grab that for your own calculations and things like that. Um, one thing I'll note, so I just wanted to show you that's available. Uh, you can go in and click around live as it will be more interesting than my video. But uh, one thing to note is that they're giving us annual frequencies of exceedance <laughs> down to something like 10 to the minus 14 here. If I look at the tabulated results for PGA, they go down to 10 to the minus 12. These are like once per multiple millions of years rates. And you can see that the, the numbers are diving off uh, quickly. Because they have to do these kind of standardized tabulated outputs, they just run the calculations down to like very small ground motion values and up to very large ground motion values. And they just give you the numbers that come out of it. These 10 to the minus 12 cases are like some very rare ground earthquake rupture plus ground motion intensity with a 10 to the minus five probability of occurrence given that rupture. Those are not really physically meaningful. They're just super tail extrapolations out of these distributions. They don't really influence our decision-making. We don't design anything for frequencies of exceedance uh, down that low. So just as a note, when you're using these is I would probably cut at 10 to the minus six at the kind of lowest, you might even go higher. Just take all this stuff here and just throw it out. Like we shouldn't be using these kind of super low values. They're there just to help us interpolate to other numbers, so it doesn't hurt to have them there, but we shouldn't be plotting this out. We shouldn't be using that for any of our analyses or anything like that. Okay. But it is there for us. It's a great resource, very nicely documented sets of studies and things that drive a lot of the U.S. practice related to assessment of existing structures and risk analysis and design of new buildings and things like that. Okay. One last topic I wanted to touch on in this video is just some one particular calculation, and maybe I should even note it 
on this previous slide, I went by it quickly, but it can tie us together, which is that the, the very top entry in the legend, we have this 2,475 year, this is a return period. And some of our building code act applications use that return period as an anchor, and that's the ground motion intensity that's exceeded with 2% probability in 50 years. It's a little hard to see with this color scheme of their screenshot, but it's sitting down in here. So it's four times 10 to the minus four is the rate. And so you can see we've got these kind of tabulated values for these hazard curves, but we will sometimes want that, the intensity level with four times 10 to the minus four rate of exceedance. So we have to do some kind of interpolation between the points that are given to us to get that. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit with these, with these hazard curves. So just to take our Gutenberg-Richter basic example here, I've got the same figure we've looked at previously, and I've got some tabulated results for one second essay values in, in kind of 0.1 G increments, along with the rates of exceedance, right? And those are just the values off of this um, plot here, plotted every 0.1 G. And so we'll oftentimes get a, um, a table like this of numbers out of our reports, right? That looks like the kind of the bottom table at the bottom of this previous slide. And we might have to go find a, a spectral acceleration value with some specified rate of exceedance. And so let's talk this through just a little bit. So if we want to find the spectral acceleration value with a 10 to the minus 3 annual exceedance rate, I can go look at my table over here on the right, and I can see 0.2g has got a 2 times 10 to the minus 3 exceedance rate, and then 0.3g is 8 times 10 to the minus 4 and that's, that's equivalent to 0 0.8 times 10 to the minus 3. So that's a little less than 10 to the minus 3. And the, the row above is a little bigger than 10 to the minus 3. So I've got to interpolate between those two to find the, the exact SA value with a 10 to the minus 3 annual exceedance rate. Okay? And so you've probably interpolated before. That's no big deal. But one thing to, to look at here, and that's our 0.2 and 0.3G cases, right? So that's actually 0.2 is highlighted here already with the circle. And 0.3 is just drawn down here. So we can see this is a pretty, this hazard curve is looking pretty straight through here. Different color just to, let's we'll see it. It's looking pretty straight through this section here. So you'd say, okay, I can interpolate probably pretty smoothly through that. But notice this is a log log plot. And so what that suggests to me is that I should be doing my interpolation with respect to the logs of the annual rate of exceedance and the spectral acceleration. Right? If I had this kind of in a linear plot, it would look a lot different in terms of we'd have spectral acceleration and rate, and it'll look something like this if we plotted out those values in that table. And so then if I have kind of two numbers here and I'm trying to interpolate between them, I have a lot harder time where a linear interpolation is not likely to be as, as effective in filling in between the specific values I have. So I'd like to do this in long log scale. So let's just put down a couple notes about this. All right, so if I'm interpolating in linear scale, all right, let's draw a little picture here of what's going on. So if I've got x and y, I've got x1, x2, y1, y2. And if I have those two points and I want to go, go interpolate to some other value x, I'm going to draw in, I'm going to need my, my slope between those two points. And I'll come in and, and interpolate up and over to go find a corresponding y value. So in linear interpolation, the way we would deal with this kind of red line here is we'd say y is equal to, we'll use the y1 value as our starting point at the left side. And we'll say, oh, and then we'll move up from y by some amount of however far x is away from x1. And then we're going to multiply by the slope, right? So that's how far we have to move relative to x1 times the slope, which is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So this fraction here is the slope. All right? So that's linear uh, interpolation. Now let's think about this log plot here. So this um, log log scale plot, the computer plot in the bottom, this would be the same shape if we took logs of spectral acceleration and logs of the rates of exceedance and then plotted the results in linear scale. Right? So that the log scaling here 
effectively does that log transformation visually, but leaves us the original units on the labels with the artifact that the labels are no longer equally spaced. So if we want to do interpolation of, of a plot that looks uh, like that bottom one and have a straight line like the red line in the bottom plot, what we can do is we can do a logarithmic interp interpolation. Before I spell out the equation, I'll note well, I have some additional text about this in the book in section 6.4.1 for some kind of text about this and, and these formulas. But the idea is going to be we'll just take logarithms of the x and the y values in that linear interpolation formula. So we'll have log y equals log y1 plus log x minus log x1, and then we'll have log i2 minus log y1 over log x2 minus log x1. Okay, so that formula will give us a log interpolation that where we'll get a straight line in the log log plot. The result from that will give us a, we'll have a log y value, and we can just take an exponential of that result to get back to the, the actual y value we're Okay, so that's an excuse to talk through that interpolation. Coming back to our 10 to the minus 3 annual exceedance rate, what we can do is we can use those values above and below the target exceedance rate and, and do our logarithmic interpolation here to um, get the value we're looking for. And the interesting thing is with regard to this interpolation rate, we're specifying an, an exceedance rate. So this is going to be an x in our formulas, our interpolation formulas, even though we plot it on the y-axis. So what we can do is we can use the, the values in our table. We're going to have x values for our rates and y values for our SAs. So this will be x1, y1, x2, y2 for our numbers. And take logarithms, put them in that very bottom formula on the slide, get a log y. Take an exponential of it, and what we'll find is for lambda equals 10 to the minus 3, gives us spectral acceleration equals 0 0.275 g. Okay, And so it's between 0.2 and 0.3, as we would expect from our table. Closer to 0.3, that number's a little closer into the 10 to the minus 3 we're looking for. And that um, 0 0.275 g, it's like here it would plot at about point here, and that's going to plot at 10 to the minus 3. And that'll be at a That'll be in our straight line interpolation in this log log plot, rather than the kind of dipped over one in the linear plot. The point of all this was just to help talk through about interpolating to get the IM values with a given uh, return period, and to give us an excuse to talk about this logarithmic interpolation a bit. Since we're doing so much in log log scale, it's worth spending a few minutes to talk that up. Okay, so we will uh, stop there with our PSHA calculations. Uh, moving on, we'll get to some other kind of derivative calculations and output results from hazard calculations that we can use to better understand the results we're getting from these types of studies. Okay, that's all for now.